In a way, infrastructures extend us into the outside world. The very flows of the city become the flows of our bodies. The core of any notion of being modern and being urban is to be networked into huge assemblages and systems of producing energy, producing food, producing water, communicating, moving bodies and commodities and goods. I think they're fascinating, these systems, partly because they are so ignored. It's really vital to, to remember that the internet is, is physical. You know, the internet can be, can be touched, it, it, it is material, it exists, because so much of the rhetoric surrounding co concepts of cyberspace, for example, suggests that it's somehow just a sort of magic, ethereal realm that exists out there almost on its own. In 2010, it was estimated that the world produced more than 1,000 exabytes of new data equivalent to one trillion gigabytes. Since the data rarely stays put, the amount that is transferred and processed is even greater. In 2008, an estimated 9.5 zettabytes, equivalent to nine and a half trillion gigabytes, passed in and out of the world's servers. Where does all this information go? How does a Google search or an email get from one corner of the planet to another? How does data move from city to city? from office to office, from house to house. Some of it, at least, probably passes through this building in Lower Manhattan, 60 Hudson Street. 60 Hudson Street is one of the world's most concentrated hubs of internet connectivity. Inside on the ninth floor, a company by the name of Telex operates the building's most densely populated interconnection area, where channel upon channel of local, national, and global fiber optic cables all converge to exchange traffic. When you sit down and you think about how much bandwidth, how much traffic is going through a site like this, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll kind of boggle your brain, but there's no time for that. This is a variety of different cables. The yellow is fiber, the gray is copper. Um, it's a variety of different cables. Essentially what we have is every customer has a cabinet or a cage and we will run a cable from their cabinet or cage into our media area. That cable will terminate on one of these panels. Once he has that panel within our interconnection area, it enables him to cross-connect to any other customer. It was a revelation that when I would, you know, sit down and, and try to type a, a, a search in my computer, that there was this whole remarkable back end to uh, the internet uh, where all this equipment was living. 60 Hudson Street is a, an interesting building because it's been a key communications hub for quite some time and has sort of made the leap from the old days of Western Union and the telegraph uh, to the digital age. It's where m many of the, the networks that connect all these computers and, and uh, tie the internet together uh, intersect. Although 60 Hudson Street is one of the most dramatic examples of concentrated urban internet infrastructure, it is by no means alone. There is the former Port Authority building at 111 8th Avenue, recently purchased by Google for nearly $2 billion. And then there is the former AT&T Long Lines headquarters at 32 Avenue of the Americas. Similar buildings can also be found in cities throughout the United States, including one Wilshire in Los Angeles, the Weston Building in Seattle, the Palo Alto Internet Exchange outside of San Francisco, and many others. The Internet is a network of networks. It is comprised of thousands of autonomous units that extend their reach by voluntarily linking to one another. 60 Hudson Street and other buildings like it throughout the world all function in much the same manner. They provide the space for network interconnection to occur. Well, public internet exchanges, uh, you have Equinix that operates some. Um, uh, there's a nonprofit one called NYCX. Uh, there's NIAX and uh, LAIAX, which are owned and operated by Tele uh, Telehouse America. Uh, you have tons of different ones in Europe. Um, they are basically big ethernet switches where carriers interconnect. Uh, that's basically how the internet came to be what it is today, is just carriers inter interconnecting with each other and exchanging traffic. A global map of the internet 
demonstrates that its geography largely matches that of pre-existing trade and communications networks. Big, affluent cities get connected, poor and developing areas much less so. It is no surprise, then, that New York City, a dense population center and leading hub of international finance and culture, houses vast concentrations of internet infrastructure. Not only is the internet physical, it's actually very, it has a very, very precise and often, ironically, very limited geography in terms of the really big strategic concentration. It's a giant market for communication services, which centers overwhelmingly in the big metropolitan regions, especially the big, affluent, high-tech, um, information-rich regions like New York, L.A., London, and so on. Yet while it is no wonder that New York City houses large concentrations of internet infrastructure, the precise geography of these concentrations is a bit more curious. How did 60 Hudson Street become such a massive node of internet connectivity? Why here, in this building, at this address, and not somewhere else? Why here, and not somewhere else? Largely because the building was already well connected and fully equipped with the conduit necessary for cables to pass in and out. First, it was a hub of pneumatic tubes, then a hub of telegraph cables, then telephone lines, and now, fiber optic cables. 60 Hudson Street was ready-made for the internet, and it demonstrates the tendency of communications infrastructure to retrofit pre-existing networks to suit the needs of new technologies. Any conduit is good conduit when you're out in the city uh, trying to connect a customer. So the, the, uh, the fact, again, that we uh, own all of our own utilities, gives us water, gives us sewer, gives us electric, gives us fiber, all these you know, opportunities we have to access a customer without having to dig up a street or string a phone pole. As one walks through the narrow corridors of blinking equipment in the Telex ninth floor meet me room, it's tough not to feel like something very important is happening here. Something beyond the power of the equipment itself. Technology does not exist in a vacuum. It is shaped by the many people and institutions that extract value from it. With all this infrastructure, all this sunk capital, there is obviously much value to extract from 60 Hudson Street. I always say infrastructure is something that is necessary. It fulfills, you know, it can be used for something. You know. So from whoever the user's perspective, it is necessary. But it's indeterminate. So how it gets used, for what it gets used, makes a lot of difference. The power of these technologies comes when they encounter other forces, the non-digital. Historically, for example, empires, all empires have relied on having powerful systems of communication to allow dominant metropolitan centers of control, you know, the capitals of empires, to communicate with militaries, with economic subservience, with, um, with the, the geographic territories of empire. So communication is bound up historically and in the contemporary period with empire projects, if you like. Is 60 Hudson Street an outpost of some global empire? It is perhaps more accurate to look at 60 Hudson Street as an outpost of not one, but many global empires a crucial link in scores of financial, cultural, and commercial circuits. A combination of historic, technological, and economic forces has embedded this concentrated piece of internet infrastructure in the dense, urban core of Lower Manhattan. Here, bundled, buried, and behind closed doors, some of mankind's trillions of gigabytes fly in and out on their way to their destinations. 